let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are gathered here in the name of the Lord, and I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, thy word says, you spoke and it came to be. You commanded it to form. The Lord will send a blessing on everything you put your hand to. Oh Lord, we submit this endowment lecture into thy mighty hands. Lord, bless this. We come to you to seek your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in a meaningful session. Oh Lord, bless our resource person, and I pray that her ideas will be beneficial to us. Thank you, Lord, for providing excellent education to the students for the numerous activities carried out by the English department so far. I place our principal and every member of teaching staff and every student into your mighty hands. Bless them and make them shine for the sake of the college. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to glorify your name. Lord, we humble ourselves before your majesty. Mighty God, be with us and lead us the entire session. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I would now like to invite our principal, Dr. Lillian Jasper, to deliver the welcome address. Good evening to all of you. I would like to welcome you all to the annual Dr. Rita Jacob Cherian Memorial Lecture, which celebrates the memory of a gentle and dignified principal of the illustrious 100-year-old college. Dr. Cherian inspired and motivated both her students and colleagues to reach new heights. She was an erudite scholar and a very humane person this year, we have one of her former students, Ms. Anupama Raju, who will deliver the lecture. I would like to welcome her to this August gathering. I would like to ask, I, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Cherian's family, former faculty, and alumna who have joined us this evening. Anupama, I'm sure that Dr. Cherian would have been proud of all the things that you've been doing all these years and would have been very happy to know that you have done so well in life. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here today. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Annie Kuryachin and her team for organizing this event. Wishing you all a very pleasant and happy evening. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We now have uh, Ms. Anna Matthew, Assistant Professor in the Department of English Shift 1, who will give us some insight into the life of Dr. Rita Jacob Cherian, who's, in whose memory we've gathered here today. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor of sharing a few words about my beloved teacher, colleague, and mentor, late Dr. Rita Jacob Cherian, in whose memory this annual endowment lecture is instituted by her family and organized by the Department of English Women's Christian College. Mrs. Cherian, as we fondly remember her, joined the department in the year 1968 and served the college in various capacities, including head of department from 1994 to 2003 and principal from 2003 till her retirement in 2006. Mrs. Cherian holds a special place in the hearts of all whose lives she, she touched, both students and colleagues alike. Her students of numerous decades cherished her English classes, as well as her deeply insightful lectures on literature, which were a fine blend of reading, scholarship, sensitivity, and gentle wit. Principled yet unassuming, Mrs. Cherian was an inspiring teacher, visionary leader, and able administrator 
whose hallmarks were grace, poise, and quiet dignity, made possible by an unshakable faith in God. A woman of few words, anyone who approached Mrs. Cherian with a problem, personal or professional, was sure to receive a sound perspective from her, which would serve as a sure guide or solution and stayed in mind for a long time. Her genuine concern for her colleagues and students and the quiet ways she expressed this has inspired our department to carry on her legacy years after her retirement and subsequent demise in July 2017. Through Mrs. Cherian's life and service, we learned to value the things that really matter, both as teachers and as human beings. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to introduce our speaker, Ms. Anupama Raju. Uh, Ms. Anupama Raju is a poet, novelist, literary journalist, communications professional, and translator. She is the author of C, a novel, and Nine, a poetry collection. Her poetry has been featured in several poetry anthologies and publications. She has been translating Malayalam writer Paul Zakaria's short stories into English. As a free contributor and freelance contributor and columnist, she writes for the Hindu and scroll.in. Uh, she collaborated with French photographer Pascal Bernard on two Indo-French poetry and photography projects titled Surfaces and Depths and Yonville en lieu une personne. She was also a, Ch a Charles Wallace Fellow at the University of Kent, Canterbury. An alumna of Women's Christian College, Chennai, Ms. Anupama Raju lives in India and works for a US-based technology services company. Ms. Anupama works in strategic communications at UST, a leading digital services company headquartered in California. She headed UST's internal communications uh, globally for many years and has more than 15 years of experience in the corporate sector. She juggles her time between her corporate and creative commitments. We are very happy to have her with us this evening and we are really looking forward to listening to her. I now invite Ms. Anupama Raju to address the audience. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, Anupama, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, let me begin by thanking you all for such uh, kind words. And thank you, Dr. Lillian, Lillian Jasper, principal, Dr. Annie Kuryatin, and the entire Department of English for inviting me to deliver this lecture. This is a very special occasion because it is in memory of Dr. Rita Cherian. You have already said uh, what she stood for. For me, she would always remain in my memories as a forceful yet quiet and elegant professor who inspired and encouraged me in many, many ways. I'm very thankful for this opportunity to speak in the presence of the professors who taught me, including uh, Professor Jasper, Professor Helen Timaya, Professor Singarawil, and in case, I don't know, I'm, I can't see everybody, but in case Professor Chalaya, Professor Devdas, and if Dr. Maslamani are also here. Thanks to Dr. Cherian's family as well. I'm very happy to be here as an old student more than anything else. And I'm really eager to meet the students after this lecture. Now I'm moving on to the responsibility you have all given me to deliver this year's Dr. Rita Jacob Cherian Memorial Endowment Lecture. And my subject is 
how embedding poetry in organizational communication can add value to employees in companies. For that, I'd like to begin by providing a little bit of context to what organizations is, organizations are. And I'm particularly putting this in context, keeping in mind our students. What does an organization do? It brings people together. People like you, whether you choose to become professors, graphic designers, graphic novelists, journalists, or ad professionals. An organization is a unit, an entity, and when managed meaningfully, it can become part of who you are. If you, as an employee, and the organization you are part of are able to build a reasonably satisfactory relationship. While the onus of building this relationship rests on both parties, it is the organization that has the greater responsibility of creating and sustaining a culture that employees thrive in. It is here that communication becomes central. Because an organization is about its people first and foremost. And people communicate in order to connect. That's what we do. Whether you are an introvert or an extrovert, doesn't matter. A well-designed, people-centric communication engine thrives on the philosophy that no woman is an island. I'm sure Dunn does not mind the liberty I've taken with his words. You may all be knowing that he said no man is an island. So communication connects people. It gives them purpose. And it is this purpose that helps organizations motivate their employees too. Employees need to be kept engaged and happy for that organization to succeed. Dr. Lillian started by welcoming us all and wishing us a happy evening. At the end of the day, happiness is what matters, isn't it? And communication can play a role in that. The size of the organization, industry, the country, race, ethnic, or age backgrounds of the people just don't matter. Irrespective of the diverse groups of employees, an organization must keep its people and employees at its core and communicate to them purposefully. It is perhaps for this reason that internal or organizational communication has been a subject of study for many decades now. I'll quickly take you through some of these accepted definitions. Certain terms are used interchangeably or synonymously when referring to organizational communication. There is managed communication system, and this could include newsletters, staff briefings, meetings, intranet, videos, internal social media, and so on. For WCC, we have the famous Sunflower magazine. I remember that very well. I presume we still have that going. Other terms for organizational communication include employee communication. Internal marketing is also another term that's used. We can also refer to it as integrated internal communications, taking into account all formal and informal communication at all levels. Some research scholars establish internal communication as a relationship management and commitment building function. In fact, one scholar has gone on to say that this is a central process 
in which employees share information, create relationships, make meanings, and construct organizational culture and values. So, based on these definitions and my own experience in the corporate sector, I can easily tell you that for a great organization to thrive, it has to be rooted in a culture that encourages and establishes honest, open, transparent, and compassionate conversations. The last adjective, compassionate, takes me to what organizational communication should really be in today's context. Perhaps for those of you who have ambitions of setting up your own companies or building corporate careers, this may come in handy. In fact, not just in corporate sectors, in any sector. Because wherever you go, you need to take care of your employees. Or you need to take care of the teams you will end up managing as you grow in the company that you become part of. And your literary sensibilities, the fact that you are students of literature can be the most powerful tool that you can use in your careers. The hours you spend studying Shakespeare, Sylvia Plath, Keki Daruwala, T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, Vikram Seth, Paramal Murugan, Mahashweta Devi, Beckett, or Albert Camus can come back to you in the most surprising ways, like they did for me. We are all products of who we have read, who we were at some point of time. The professors who introduced you to poetry, drama, fiction, and fascinating debates and events are, even without their own knowledge, sowing seeds in you to use the literature you are studying today in wonderfully crazy and unorthodox ways in every profession you will pursue after college. I say this because every century comes with its own milestones of progress and evolution, discoveries and fascinating challenges. The nature of an organization and the nature of our own species have evolved across time. People's needs are also changing and companies are compelled to take this evolution, this change into account. In recent decades, especially with the rise of the knowledge economy, now I'm using a little bit of corporate jargon here, but Maybe many of you are already aware of this term, knowledge economy. Basically, uh, industries where we use our knowledge, right? Thinking professions. With the rise of the knowledge economy, many social scientists and management scholars have observed that companies can survive only if they addressed the individualism and the plurality of the human race. And the communication departments play a critical role in fulfilling this responsibility. As the globe keeps shrinking with people connecting across time zones, languages, and cultures, organizations have to take this into account. Whether it is routine day-to-day -day communication between employees or employees and the management, an organization may struggle with ensuring a personalized and meaningful connect 
through its formal channels. Email-based newsletters, digital announcements, collaboration platforms, podcasts, and videos can all start becoming all too predictable, ridden with cliches and industry jargon. With the onset of the pandemic, the world experienced a collective crisis. No industry or sector was spared. A majority of organizations adapted as humans tend to do during a crisis. In order to survive, many adopted a remote model. Communication suddenly became possible only with an abundant reliance on technology. Virtual meetings and shut cameras precipitated these problems, posing new challenges for their communication departments. Human Connect went out of the window. And with work patterns and models dramatically shifting, many companies around the world are still trying out various methods of trying to keep their employees connected in this resilient new world. This is where I'd like to talk about exploring the use of poetry or poetic language to help employees when it comes to organizational communication. Now, as I start talking about the use of poetry in a company, I would like to take you uh, on a brief virtual tour of the organization I'm working in currently, that is UST. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, do let me know if you're able to see it. Can you see this? Yes, it's yes, visible. Yes. Oh. OK, excellent. Thank you. So uh, this is where I work, UST, right? And the picture that you see is our beautiful campus. We are all very proud of it, exactly the way uh, I'm proud of WCC. And every time I see the building, I get so nostalgic. Uh, and I'm really waiting to come and visit the college. So this is our campus, the campus of UST in Trivandrum. Uh, we are about a uh, 30,000 strong organization. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. And uh, we believe in impact unbound, right? Now here itself, you can see the play of words. It is slightly poetic and that's what writers do. You know, we're, all, we're constantly trying to see how we can take well-known words, uh, which may be stale, but then use them in, in an innovative way. So our marketing team came up with this tagline, instead of saying unbound impact, impact unbound, right? So as I was saying, for the many years that I headed internal communications at UST, the company I work in, my team and I experimented with creative ways of crafting and delivering corporate messages to our employees. And this particularly became important because we're a global organization like any other MNC. We're spread all over the globe, right? I mean, I work out of, I live and work out of Trivandrum, um, but our company's headquartered in California and we have 30,000 employees spread all across the world. Right, including Chennai, by the way. <laughs> we have an office in Chennai as well. So yeah, a reasonably young organization, UST has grown rapidly to become a robust 30,000 strong digital services company that it is today. Right through, it has always encouraged and cultivated a, a 
a culture of freedom, creativity, and entrepreneurship. I have had the good fortune of working with a management that gave me the freedom to implement certain techniques typically associated with poetry or broadly speaking with creative writing. It is this intersection between creativity, poetry, and communication in corporate organizations that motivated me to explore it further in the form of a doctoral thesis. Right now, I'm pursuing my PhD, my part-time PhD program, but still in very, very early stages. So while I'm still exploring this and my research, I mean, therefore my research is in its initial stages, but here are some of my observations and questions. There's research that supports the view that relationships are built through communication and that communication provides a way for individuals to express emotions, share hopes and ambitions and celebrate and remember accomplishments. According to some scholars who brought in employee-centered perspectives for internal communication, the goals of organizational communication include contributing to internal relationships and promoting a positive sense of belonging, which is what uh, you are all doing uh, when you bring out a newsletter, right? I'm, I mean, right now I'm talking to the students particularly. A newsletter, what are you doing? You are, you are keeping that community close and connected. This is where we can probably see the best scope for exploring the use of poetry, especially in formal channels of organizational communication. For that, we need to know what are some of the typical formal and managed forms of internal communication in an organization. So you have newsletters, then of course you have routine emails, you have the intranet, company blogs, and so on. And in, in an organization like WCC, we already talked about um, Sankla. Um, I'm sure there are other wonderful new things which have emerged. These platforms or these formal methods or channels serve a purpose. Some of the students who are listening to this lecture may be part of the team that puts Sunflower Magazine together. So you know what you are trying to do. Formal channels in an organization help employees to know about the organization's direction, expectations, and strategy, their own job security, which promote a sense of well being, peace, calm, and positivity. If the formal communication is not effective, then employees tend to informal channels such as grapevine gossip, and also personal interactions, which may lead to misinformation, and that can be dangerous. This is probably why organizations invest in systematic, regular, and formal communication channels to minimize the dependency on misleading information, because it can cost them, right? Misleading information can lead to all sorts of problems. The challenge is when the formal channels take away the personalized human connect. And I did hint at that earlier. Some research examines how employees can be engaged through internal communication 
in a digitally transformed world, right? The generation that is in college today, this is, all of you know the term, digital natives, right? When I was doing what you are doing currently, this was before the smartphone, this was before the mobile phone, right? Life was a lot simpler. I'm sure you've heard this from various people. And uh, uh, so, you know, it, is, it was a lot simpler. People couldn't get to you, right? That maybe when we meet, we will joke about it. So coming back to what I was saying, How can employees be engaged through internal communication in a digitally transformed world? Because how do we maintain the human connect to ensure the right messaging without technology not overpowering it? That is the question. Poetry and other forms of creative expression can be introduced in digital and formal communication channels, even in companies to maintain and nurture the human connect. Certain studies point to the relationship between internal communication, employee engagement, and employee motivation. These studies con conclude that leaders who meaningfully and regularly communicate with their employees, use motivating language, empathetic and direction giving words. In a sense, we could even link this to something called the broaden and build theory. This was proposed in 1998 by someone called Barbara Fredrickson. And this particular article was published in the Review of General Psychology in 1998. And it is considered a path-breaking theory. So I'm trying to see if I can use this theory in my research as well. So in the theory, Fredrickson talks about positive emotions and how they can have an influence on- Sanupama? Yes. I briefly interrupt. Uh, are you trying to move your slides because they aren't moving no. on our screen? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, Thank not. you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, would you like me to hide this? If that's maybe. This. No, that's okay. So long as uh, you're in control of what's happening on the screen, it's fine. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yes. I hope you're not getting tired of seeing my face. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> right. Okay. So as I was saying, the uh, broaden and build theory proposes that positive emotions have an influence on people's health and well-being and also on actions. And my argument is that poetry contributes to positive emotions of employees. But first, let's look at poetry and try to answer the seemingly absurd question of how it could make sense to companies and employees engaged in jobs that are far removed from literature. So the question is this. I just have, can you see this slide? Yes. Yeah, it's just two questions, that's it. So what is poetry? Let us address that. And how is it perceived? Now we all know what poetry is, right? I mean, I'm in the presence of professors who know this much better than I do. As students of literature, not only are you studying poetry, some of you may be writing poetry too. Maybe some of you are spoken word artists, right? Maybe you have ambitions of, of publishing and writing poetry. I don't know, but I certainly hope so. And at the end of this lecture, I would be really interested in knowing how you as students of literature define poetry. As far as I'm concerned, 
as someone who has been writing and publishing poetry for the last 17 years or so, I define poetry as a compact, beautiful, and artistic reflection on life. It's like capturing and experiencing life in a fistful of words. Can this gorgeous art form make sense in a business or a corporate world? Can it make sense to employees far removed from literature, no matter which sector they work in? In the book, What Poetry Brings to Business, Claire Morgan with Kirsten Lange and Ted Buswick argue that reading and reflecting on poetry nurtures complex and flexible thinking along with empathy and an improved ability to understand the thoughts and feelings of others. I love that book. Poetry can also help in throwing light on what otherwise gets buried or taken for granted in organizational rhetoric and conversations. So these research studies are pointing to how poetry can help managements in companies. But can it help employee communication? There is a lot of bias and prejudice out there. Poetry is perceived as something that is written and read only by a small group of individuals, relatively speaking. How will employees take it seriously? Unless they see it benefits them in an organizational context, how will they value it? I'd like to now show you some practical examples of how poetry can be used in formal communication. First, I'll take you through some scenarios where we can maybe use poetry. And after that, I'll show you a couple of examples of how we implemented it in USD, where I work in strategic communications. So we are now going to talk about the practical application of poetry in organizational communication. Employee newsletters, as I've already observed, are common channels of managed internal communication in an organization. Besides being used to inform the employees of a company's strategy, news and leadership announcements, they also need to perform the role of positively engaging and motivating the employees. As that is one of the goals of internal communication. However, if the news needs to be conveyed during uncertain times or a crisis, formal email-based newsletters may not be effective. Using a few lines from a poem or using poetic language to set the context while communicating a major change announcement or news during uncertain times, like a pandemic, or let's say when one company buys out another company, it could bring in doubt, unease, uncertainty, or fear among employees. Fear of job loss, right? So quoting a few lines of a reassuring poem can bring in an element of hope and positivity. For instance, a poem like Although the Wind by Izumi Shikubu is short and could appeal to people as it brings in hope even in bad times. 
and it is brief enough to be embedded in an email-based newsletter. This poem could bring in a tone of hope and human connection into an otherwise impersonal email-based newsletter. So I'm just gonna read the poem for you. Although the wind blows terribly here, the moonlight also leaks between the roof planks of this ruined house. Here, the reference to moonlight brings in the humanizing element that restores hope and adds life to an otherwise dull email that may have otherwise been plain or ridden in management jargon. Another scenario where poetry could be used is when the leader of an organization or let's say uh, the management of a company wants to convey or announce something to the employees. Leaders in any organization are expected to be empathetic and their use of motivating and empathetic language is said to have a positive impact on employees. And poetry fosters interpersonal understanding. This is the point Claire Morgan makes in her book too. The ability to see the world through the eyes of others is a critical and all too rare management skill. If you sit inside people's heads, it's easier to convince them, says Morgan. A CEO or members of the top management could begin their employee address, for instance, by quoting a poem or by sharing a few lines to show they too are human and share similar emotions as the employees. Poetic metaphors like ray of light can be used to motivate employees when a leader incorporates them in their verbal communication. The following short poem, My Brilliant Image by Hafiz, can be inserted in a CEO newsletter, for instance, if the objective is to empathize and offer moral support during a crisis. The poem goes like this. I wish I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. It's one of my all time favorites. Senior managers could use a few lines from a poem to convey empathy and share grief if a team member has lost a family member. The poem, Funeral Blues, I'm sure all of you know the poem by W.H. Auden is an apt example here. This poem describes the emotions of the poet persona who is grieving the death of a loved one. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone, silence the pianos, and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. The loss of a loved one brings grief to everyone, and it is a universal experience. When a poem such as this is used in an email or even as a voice note between a manager and an employee who has just lost someone, it creates a shared experience for both, immediately bringing in more bonding between the manager and the employee. Another scenario of how poetry can be used in a company is communicating complex information. Poetry allows for connection of abstract ideas 
dissimilar concepts and thoughts. A poet could choose to compare a working day to a desert. A working day and a desert are completely disconnected entities, yet a poem makes these connections to convey a certain meaning. This use of metaphors and this ability of poetry can be used in internal communications to convey complex information that may seem ambiguous. It is critical for any employee to come to terms sometimes with ambiguity when there are no clear answers. And believe me, every organization will go through those periods. Sometimes quick decisions need to be based, need to be made based on incomplete information. A manager will not have all the answers. At that time, a few lines from a poem or poetic sensibilities or poetic techniques can be used to communicate and make decisions. Internal communications professionals can look at this aspect of poetry and embed poetic language in messages to help employees deal with ambiguity. Moving on to my last section, which is, I'm just gonna give you one more example and then I'll quickly move into what we did in USD. We can also use poetry to appreciate employees through formal and informal channels. Electronic greeting cards or notes, personalized notes with poetry extracts that thank and appreciate employees could be created by organizational communication or internal communication departments. This recognizes employees. This can become part of an appreciation communication toolkit for all employees to use in order to develop a positive organizational culture of gratitude and appreciation. Now, let me show you a couple of examples of what we did in USD, especially during the pandemic. For employees in the IT industry particularly, it was a major seismic shift from a structured work culture in the office, surrounded by teams, to a work from home space. All of you know how it is the lines between the personal and the professional get blurred. And worse, people were on call all the time and they had to handle their fears of the virus, take care of themselves, their families, and also work. Many of them had to cope with the loss of loved ones too. And so, as members of the communication department, we came up with whatever we could do to comfort them. This is one specific example that I would love to show you. I'm not sure how clear it is, but News at Noon is our daily corporate newsletter, USD's daily corporate newsletter, which means it goes out every single working day, Monday to Friday, without fail, to our 30,000 employees around the globe. So we literally, you know, the uh, internal communications department literally works like a newspaper, right? We're constantly, every day, generating content. Now here, I don't know how many of you recognize this individual, but Lem Sisse is a very popular and celebrated British poet, performance artist, and author. Um, he's also a broadcaster. Now, a few years ago, I had the good fortune of coming across his his work and uh, and some of his words were phenomenal so when the pandemic struck in the early in the early period in 2020 what we did was every news i mean every newsletter every day every edition begins with an editor's note with the editorial so here it started with that particular day it started with his poem how do you do it said night. How do you wake and shine? I keep it simple, said light, one day at a time. 
those days nobody had the answers right uh, as communication as the communications department all we could do was give our employees some sense of hope that all we could do was take things one day at a time <clears throat> so this is one one example another example when we talk about poetry um it doesn't always have to be the classics it doesn't always have to be the printed word it could also be creative forms or poetic forms right creative imagery referencing poetry as seen in cinema i don't know how many of you out there are kung fu panda fans i am a huge fan right so here again in in 2020 in the in the early times we were trying to entertain and motivate our employees because those were tough times we all know that all of us experienced it right so what we did was we introduced something called the kung fu panda corner in the daily newsletter and this went on for many months and uh, the words of master ugwe uh, master shifu uh, and so on and so forth were presented through our newsletter to the employees along with other regular news you know um for instance philosophical and brief creative poetic lines that these characters spoke in the movies were were brought in of course uh, in order to ensure that there were no copyright issues the newsletter also acknowledged the sources but this is just to give you a sense of how we did it these articles and extracts were received with positive affirmation many employees wrote back with their feedback on how this consoled them therefore poetry need not be confined to the writers and readers of poetry after you graduate wherever you choose to pursue your dreams you can implement poetry and creative or imaginative methods to help your employees and colleagues i'm certain your generation will have your own magnificent ways of inspiring the employees of the future even as you get back to your mobile phones after this lecture i hope you will look at poetry with new eyes poetry for the sake of people thank you at this point i think we have a short window for interactions so if students have any questions you can turn on your cameras and raise your hands anaga go ahead yeah um Yes. Hello, ma'am. I just had a question because you said that um, poetry should be incorporated at the managerial level, like mm -hmm. if you're talking corporate. So yes. I was wondering if you'd recommend incorporating these sorts of classes, at least in uh, elective form, in business programs like EBA or MBA in school. Well, uh, eventually, that I mean, to tell you the truth, that is my vision. And that is my ambition. and i sincerely hope that um both students and academic professionals do see merit in that idea and that is the reason i'm doing this research and i'm trying to create a structured way of looking at it but yes i believe uh, that would be beneficial because we are living in a world where disciplines are merging you know um the arts cannot survive on their own science and technology cannot survive on their own there has to be an intersection between these disciplines so i think um integrating literature or integrating an element of the arts even in a management or a business program will definitely add value thank you for the questions thank you do we have any more questions
Okay. If not, then um, I would like to. In oh, okay. We have another one. Shrita. Shrita, kindly unmute. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. you are. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is not a question, but I just wanted to say something. Uh, uh, your uh, your talk reminded me of an article I read by you. It's called, I think, Words Over the Counter in the Hindu. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, not to digress, but I just... Uh, not to digress, but I just wanted to mention that the article actually inspired me to start a podcast, like a poetry podcast. Oh, I see. During the pandemic. <laughs> That's fabulous. I'm so happy to know that. That is amazing. In fact, um, one of the thing, one of the books I mentioned in that feature is called The Poetry Pharmacy. William Seagard's PS1. Yes, yes, exactly. yes. So I would definitely recommend that book to... Uh, all of you. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. That's an amazing initiative. Congratulations. Thank you for the inspiration. And I really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from students? Jesse? You can unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Um, so ma'am, you were saying how you were saying how poetry actually plays a huge role in organizational communications, and that and I guess that will be best started in the young at, at a very young level. But at the same time, from what I understand from my mother, who is a teacher, reading especially has gone down tremendously. So how do you suggest like uh, making instigating that interest in reading in poetry or any other thing actually? You're talking about how reading has dropped, right? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, Anupama, I think that's what she uh, meant. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, and that is, I mean, all the more reason, all the more reason why we need to uh, ensure that there is a practical and a realistic application of literature, right? If we make it, if we make it essential, uh, and if we are able to demonstrate why literature or why poetry or any kind of literature is makes a difference to companies, and if we are able to show the benefit, then people will automatically start doing it, right? Uh, I mean, why do why do we have a glass of milk? Because we are told that it has it has demonstrative value. Uh, it gives us calcium. We, we say an apple a day keeps a doctor away. And we know that, right? So, and we eat an apple or we eat fruits. Similarly, if we are able to show value and if we are able to demonstrate that by uh, proving it uh, with data, with metrics, then I'm sure there will be a time when people pick up reading and pick up poetry books and suddenly you would be living in a world where everybody is reading poetry. I think we have another question from Mr. John Poonen. Good, good evening. I'm, uh, I'm Rita's, uh, Rita Turian's brother uh, from, uh, I live in the US. Um, so okay. one of the things I wanted to say is uh, we always struggle in a technical world and I'm a technical uh, programmer and for many years where uh, young and old, so poetry is a communication mechanism to bring shared thoughts together. So when, for example, when we work in software engineering, we are always concerned about uh, bugs in the software. Right. And I was reminded from your talk that we should use out damned spark is a very, very important uh, thing to say. We have to get rid of every blemish that is in the software before we release it. True. The other thing that I thought about, and, and there could be a, a huge collection of these types of uh, things. There is a Latin uh, word called margarita 
a stercore. That mm -hmm. means a pearl from a dunghill. So mm -hmm. when we do machine learning and artificial intelligence, that's what we are looking for. Right. So there is a whole bunch of these things. And I was thinking that a lot of our communication with um, uh, teams, large teams, where most people don't talk, this encourages people with common understanding to uh, speak about what do you think about this? And mm -hmm. that is a good way of encouraging participation. When, when I was working at uh, British Petroleum very early before they had their problems, they used to say every meeting has to start with a health, safety, or environment tip. Now, there's no reason why we could not say every meeting has to start with a poem or a poetry or a small uh, mm -hmm. inspirational thing instead of putting lots of boring confidentiality and things in front, put a poetry, one simple line like you've done. So I'd be very interested in talking to you about that offline to sure. say these are the ideas that uh, that one could be, yeah. Sure, thank so, you so much. We need, uh, we need uh, patrons like you, uh, you know, who will be able to bridge the gap between technology and literature. Thank you so the, much. The only advantage I have is old age. So we are <laughs> trying to uh, uh, figure out how to connect with people who are 40 years younger than you, but are also programmers. That's very difficult. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in this context, there's this book I would uh, definitely recommend in case any of you are interested. It's a really fun book. You know, It's called The Poetry of Business Life. It's an anthology. And you have all sorts of interesting uh, poems on all sorts of uh, professions, accounting and uh, banking and, uh, and so on. So it's a fun book to have. Unfortunately, I think those are all the questions we have time for. So we need to wrap up this session. So I would like to invite Ms. Sweetlin Moses, Assistant Professor from the Department of English, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Amita. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. On behalf of the Department of English, I take this opportunity to thank Ms. Anupama Raju for graciously accepting our invitation and for her meaningful insights that not only strike a chord but address a very pertinent need in the current context. We are thankful to our principal, Dr. Lillian I. Jasper, and the management for their constant support and encouragement. We are grateful to the family and friends of Dr. Cherian for their graciousness and presence with us. We thank the members of the board, former heads of departments, former faculty members, members of the Alumni Association, and former students for accepting our invitation and for being present with us this evening. We thank the technical team of WCC for their assistance that enabled the smooth conduct of this program. We would also like to thank the members of the faculty and students of Women's Christian College for their presence, support, and cooperation. Thank you and have a good evening. May I quickly say something? Of course, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, no, I just want to take a, a minute to thank all of you for being such graceful hosts. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rani. Thank you again. It's been wonderful talking to everybody and, and I'm really looking forward to meeting you all in person. And, uh, and, and Dr. Lillian, thank you. Uh, I have so many memories. I'm extremely nostalgic and sentimental today. I really hope I've been able to do some justice to the memory of Dr. Rita Cherian, who touched us all. And I sincerely hope some of these thoughts um, encourage the students to think differently about how poetry can come in handy in real life, especially as they take up professional lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anupama. It was wonderful listening to you. Thank you so much. Good evening to all. Have a great evening. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We are ending the meeting now.